The subcommittees on investigations and oversight, as well as the energy environment, will come to order. Good morning. Welcome to today's hearing titled Review of the Blue Ribbon Commission on America's Nuclear Future Draft Recommendations. In front of you are packets containing the written testimony, biographies, and truth and testimony disclosures for today's witness panel. Before we get started, since this is a joint hearing involving two subcommittees, I want to explain how we will operate procedurally so that all members understand how the question and answer period will be handled. As always, we will alternate between the majority and minority members and allow all members an opportunity for questioning before recognizing a member for a second round of questions if we have time for those second rounds. We will recognize those members of either subcommittee present at the gavel in order of seniority on the full committee, and those coming in after the gavel will be recognized in order of a revival. I now recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. On January 29th, 2010, the President directed the Secretary of Energy to establish a Blue Ribbon Commission to, quote, conduct a comprehensive review of policies for managing the back of, managing the, back of the nuclear fuel cycle, including all alternatives for the storage, processing, and disposal of civilian and defense use nuclear fuel and nuclear waste, unquote. Over the last year and a half, the Commission held numerous meetings and site visits around the country in a transparent and open manner to hear a wide array of stakeholder input. I was pleased that the Commission recognized the importance of this issue in my community and came down to Georgia and South Carolina last winter and listened to the concerns held by a variety of organizations. On July 29th, the Commission released its draft recommendations announced it will seek comments on that draft until October 31st, and indicated that it will meet its deadline to deliver a final report by January 29th, 2012. That's a novel idea of meeting a deadline. This hearing allows the committee to hear expert opinions on the Commission's draft report and weigh in accordingly. At the same time, the administration formed the BRC, the Department of Energy, announced that its intention to withdraw the Yucca Mountain applicant uh, license application before the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Shortly thereafter, Secretary Chu promised that the BRC would have the authority to explore a, quote, full range of scientific and technical options, unquote. Unfortunately, it appears that that promise was broken. Co-Chair Lee Hamlin said Secretary Chu made it, quote, quite clear that nuclear waste storage at Yucca Mountain is not an option and that the Blue Ribbon Commission will be looking at better alternatives, unquote. While the BRC Charter does not expressly prohibit the consideration of Yucca Mountain, it is not surprising that the BRC draft recommendations ignore the 900-pound gorilla in the room. That 900-pound gorilla, not 800-pound, but 900-pound gorilla, or more appropriately, the $15 billion gorilla, was actually recommended by Secretary Chu months before he joined this recommendation. He made the recommendation of Yucca Mountain. Given the longstanding acknowledgement of the need for a permanent deep geological repository, it should come as no surprise that the BRC still call for a geological repository to be expeditiously developed. Many of the Commission's other recommendations, such as the development of a quasi-governmental organization and the manner in which the Nuclear Waste Fund, which finances activities to store spent nuclear fuel, is, administ is administered are very interesting. I look forward to working with the Commission and the Administration on these recommendations, particularly the research development and demonstration provisions that fall within this Committee's jurisdiction. Ensuring a sustained, viable, and safe nuclear sector is an important part of a balanced energy portfolio, and that is enabled by responsible public and private investments in research and development. In Georgia alone, almost a quarter, 24.7 percent of, of its electricity generation comes from nuclear energy. Two power stations, Hatch and Vogel, have the capacity to generate over 4,000 megawatts of emissions-free energy. That nuclear power production also produces spent fuel. There's already a significant amount, 
2,410 metric tons of commercial spent fuel currently stored in Georgia awaiting disposition. Fuel that the people of Georgia have already paid over $700 million to dispose of. On top of the fees paid by ratepayers, the American taxpayer is on the hook for $12 billion in liabilities due to the federal government's inability to meet their legal obligation to accept spent nuclear fuel. This liability is likely to skyrocket in future years in the absence of federal action. In addition to the fuel stored at Georgia's nuclear reactors, the Savannah River site also houses a great deal of radioactive material as a result of its contribution to our nation's nuclear weapons program. I'm concerned that the BRC interim storage recommendations will be used to make the Savannah River site a de facto repository without any of the scientific study that Yucca Mountain has undergone. This concern has long been recognized and was the reason why in 1987 Congress prohibited the construction of such a facility prior to a license being issued for a permanent geological repository. This distrust brings me to another point. This administration has long claimed that it makes its decisions based on science. In 2008, the President stated that he would, quote, restore the basic principle that government decisions should be based on the best available, scientifically valid evidence, not on the ideological predispositions of agency officials or political appointees, unquote. Also, just last year, the President's press secretary stated this, quote, I think what has taken Yucca Mountain off the table in terms of a long-term solution for a repository for our nuclear waste is the science. The science ought to make these decisions, unquote. After reviewing the NRC's evaluation of whether well, Yucca Mountain meets regulatory standards, I have trouble reconciling those two statements. At this point, I would like to enter the record a majority staff report titled Yucca Mountain, the Administration's Impact on U.S. Nuclear Waste Management Policy. Without objections, so ordered. The report pointedly highlights the NRC's independent evaluation of Yucca Mountain determined the proposed repository meets all applicable safety requirements, including those related to human health and groundwater protection and the scientific performance goals set forth by the regulatory agencies. While I believe the Commission's draft recommendations offer an opportunity to explore innovative policy options, the fact that the Commission has was precluded from addressing Yucca Mountain limits the usefulness of the report. Any serious review of spent fuel management has to recognize the decades of research and billions of dollars, taxpayers' dollars, in an investment to ready Yucca Mountain to accept spent nuclear fuel. Let's also not forget that Yucca Mountain is designated by law as the nation's spent fuel repository. I hope that the Commission members will take this into consideration as they prepare their final report. With that, now I will recognize Mr. Uh, and I welcome our new ranking member, uh, Mr. Tonko. I recognize you, uh, my friend, for five minutes and look forward to working with you on this committee. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. the trust shown by um, the Democrats of the committee to uh, have me serve as their ranking minority member for the subcommittee on investigations and oversight. And I do look forward to a productive working relationship. On November 4th, 2008, the citizens of uh, this country chose then Senator Barack Obama to serve as President of these United States. He received 53 percent of the popular vote and the largest absolute number of votes of any candidate in our country's history. As a candidate, he had promised very clearly that Yucca Mountain would not be used as a nuclear waste repository. After taking office, he took steps to keep that promise. That is politics, but that is the kind of politics that lies at the heart of a functioning democracy. Apparently, President Obama's position on Yucca will not be reversed, even in the unlikely event that Congressman Paul or Governor Romney or Governor Perry win uh, the 2012 presidential election. In the Republican candidates' debate in Nevada last week, all three of them said that they would not open Yucca either. The decision to close Yucca Mountain was not driven by science. 
and it is a fiction to pretend that it was. The change that this is the charge rather that this is an example of a lack of scientific integrity only stands as an argument one way. If you can sell the idea that somehow the decision making on Yucca always hinged on science and that the new administration abandoned that path or somehow skewed the science to support a favored outcome. The truth is that the actual decision process surrounding Yucca has always been political. The administration's decision to close Yucca was a position advocated by a presidential candidate and then supported by a majority of American voters. In the United States democratic system, we also call that a mandate for change. How was Yucca selected to become the nation's permanent nuclear waste repository in the first place? You can look at the entire body of the majority's report, almost 40 pages long, but one critical term is missing. It was popularly referred to in more colloquial terms, but we might otherwise call it the Forget Nevada Amendment. The majority's report does not mention this amendment that came back from a House Senate conference committee in 1987. In 1987, two of the leading alternative sites had powerful political patrons. Texas had a site in Speaker Wright's district. Washington State had a site in Majority Leader Foley's district. It may not be too much of a shock to learn that those sites were pulled out of the competition by Congress, thereby leaving Yucca Mountain as the only alternative. At the time, Harry Reid, a former member of the INO subcommittee, was in his first year as a senator from Nevada. Two decades later, the situation has changed in remarkable ways, but with predictable consequences. Let me be clear, it was not science that led Yucca to be selected but rather political muscle exercised by highly influential members of this House and the Senate. However, none of this is in the majority staff's report. After the 1987 amendments to the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, the only site that DOE was authorized to characterize and develop was Yucca Mountain. Politicians told scientists where they could look. The state of Nevada, aside from a very small number of people, never accepted this imposition by Washington, D.C. The state has always felt it was unfair to the people of Nevada. In the face of a claim of injustice, questions about science seem small. Candidate Obama recognized the procedural failings in trying to force a waste repository on the state. His statement on Yucca speaks of science, but the core of his position was about fairness, justice, and equity. His statement reads, in relevant part, States should not be unfairly burdened with waste from other states. The majority staff report does not quote this portion of Mr. Obama's position. By ignoring this foundational claim, the majority staff report distorts a key problem with Yucca, that 49 states ganged up on one state. In such a situation, the most important quality of the site is not its geology, and it's not its hydro hydro uh, hydrology, but the fairness of how the site was selected in the first place. In other words, this is, a partially, this is partially a state's rights issue. Science can provide facts about changing, uh, changing world, but making policy is about weighing the anticipated consequences of policy options against a complex set of values and interests. To try to claim that Yucca is solely about science defaces the history of that site. The motives of President Obama and even the positions of leading Republican presidential candidates such as Governor Romney, Governor Perry, and Congressman Paul. Nevada has successfully pushed back and now has a political weight that they lacked back in 1987. I don't want to say that Yucca will never be used as a repository for waste, but if it is opened, it should be because Nevadans are willing to take the waste, not because 49 states have forced it on them. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Tonko. I'd like to ask uh, unanimous consent that the gentleman from California, Mr. Gary Mendy, be allowed to sit on in to sit on the dais with the committee and participate in the hearings. Hear no objection, so ordered. Now I recognize Dr. Harris for his opening statements. Doctor, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I first want to thank our witnesses for being here this morning as the subcommittees review the draft recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Commission on America's Nuclear Future. 
Nuclear energy is an integral component of America's energy portfolio. 104 currently operating commercial nuclear reactors deliver a clean, affordable, and reliable energy source that supplies 20 percent of America's electricity. That electricity generation, along with America's nuclear weapons programs, produce radioactive waste that the federal government has a long-standing statutory responsibility to accept and permanently dispose of. It's important to recognize how we arrived at this point. For more than 30 years, Yucca Mountain, Nevada has been extensively studied to determine if a permanent geologic repository for high-level radioactive waste can safely be constructed and operated. Taxpayers spent approximately $15 billion on this effort. And in 2008, the Department of Energy submitted an 8,600-page application to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission proposing that it could indeed be done safely. NRC scientific and technical staff reviewed this application in equally excruciating detail and agreed with the Department of Energy. Yet despite this investment and decades of scientific work, the DOE has sought to withdraw its application on political, not technical grounds, asserting that Yucca Mountain, quote, isn't a workable option, end quote, and the NRC chairman has halted all work on the application review and refused to allow for finalization of the technical review. Now, the argument that campaign promises in politics should always trump sound policy is belied by Guantanamo Bay, for instance. This is the science committee, not the politics committee. And this hearing is not only justified, but owed to the American public who long for solutions not beholden to, part, but to politics. President Obama's unilateral decision to discard decades of the scientific community's hard work and ignore the current law on the books has thrown United States nuclear waste management policy into disarray. This brings us to the Blue Ribbon Commission, established by President Obama in concurrence with his dismantling of existing nuclear waste management structure. The BRC is specifically tasked to review policies associated with managing the back end of the nuclear fuel cycle and related issues of storage, processing, and disposal of both civilian and defense nuclear waste. In July, the BRC issued its draft report to the Secretary of Energy and will release its final report by the end of January 2012. I would first like to recognize the good work put in by the members of the Commission in drafting this report. It contains valuable ideas that Congress should consider and work to be a thoughtful partner in advancing. For example, I support the BRE's interest in long-term support for research, develop, and demonstration of advanced new, uh, reactor and fuel cycle technologies that could reduce the amount of high-level radioactive waste produced and change how that waste is managed. The potential contributions of the BRC, however, appear to be limited by politics. Upon initiating the panel's work, Commission Co-Chair Lee Hamilton said that Secretary of Energy Chu, quote, made it clear that nuclear waste storage at Yucca Mountain is not an option and that the Blue Ribbon Commission should be looking at better alternatives, end quote. This action by the administration is striking not only in its audacity, it is also simply irrational to suggest that, quote, a better alternative, end quote, can be identified without a direct comparison to the current plan for which an alternative is being sought. To its credit, the Commission calls for expeditious development of a permanent geologic repository. But turning a blind eye to the elephant in the room that is Yucca Mountain will render all its efforts fundamentally flawed. Unless and until the federal government honors its legal obligation to proceed in good faith with disposal of high-level radioactive waste, the long-term viability of nuclear energy to meet growing electricity demands remains in doubt. The Blue Ribbon Commission still has an opportunity to impact this future direction, and I hope today's hearing provides it with informative and useful guidance toward that end. Today, I welcome hearing evaluations of and recommendations on the Commission's draft report. And, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Uh, Chairman now recognizes Mr. Miller, the uh, chairman of the energy, the ranking member, I'm sorry, uh, the, the ranking member of the Energy and Environment Subcommittee from North Carolina for your statement. Mr. Thank, Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a uh, very odd hearing. We are considering the draft report of a, of a Blue Ribbon Commission with no witnesses from the Commission to explain their tentative findings. Uh, they are, to their credit, uh, seeking uh, comments, presumably some from scientists. Uh, to their credit. Apparently, they want to consider those findings before they issue a final report, uh, and it certainly would be useful for this committee to hear those comments, too. Again, many, presumably, from scientists. Um, it is, it is uh, 
very likely, as, as the other, as the chairs have said, that we will need to rely more on nuclear power in the future. It's, it's kind of hard to imagine uh, an energy future in the next couple of generations that does not include uh, more nuclear power. Uh, but uh, it is still far more expensive. It is not uh, affordable compared to uh, natural gas, for instance. Uh, it is far more expensive than other forms of energy, uh, even with the massive subsidies that it does get from the federal government. Uh, and uh, with the construction of uh, capital, uh, of more nuclear power plants re requiring the capital investment of many millions of, many billions of dollars, which investors have been understandably reluctant to, uh, to put down, uh, it is not at all clear why we could not wait until the end of January to see the final resort, uh, final report of the Commission comments and all. Uh, and there are still many reasons to be concerned, despite the fact that we obviously are going to have to rely upon nuclear power more in the future. There are many reasons for caution. Uh, the experience of Fukushima uh, should underscore that uh, pretty dramatically. And undoubtedly, one of the unresolved issues is what to do with high-level nuclear waste. We already have 90, 000, excuse me, 80,000 tons of it, and that figure is growing, uh, that uh, nuclear power plants will continue to produce. Uh, and it has to be stored safely somewhere for 10,000 years. That is a long time. Uh, but even more important, it doesn't just appear magically uh, at the storage site. We have to get it there. We have to transport it from all over the country. Uh, and while it is true, I know that, that there is a witness from Nye County who would welcome the economic activity of storing the, the waste at Yucca Mountain. Uh, the people of the nearby town city of Las Vegas uh, who know that the bulk of the nuclear waste, high-level nuclear waste, will come through uh, uh, or very near Las Vegas, whether it's transported by rail or by truck, are adamantly opposed to it. The opposition of the people of Nevada uh, is pretty well shown by the adamant opposition of their congressional delegation, by President Obama's uh, opposition, by the opposition of three of the leading, as Mr. Tonko has said, three of the leading uh, can Republican candidates for president when they were asked in Nevada about it. Um, it is good to be an early primary state and a state that uh, in a general election is now a swing state. You do get a lot of attention as a result. People care, uh, people in national politics care what you think. Um, and, it, and it's also understandable that the people of Nevada are more than a little skeptical about the uh, supposed science that supports this. That has not been the history of the decision to cite a high-level nuclear repository in, uh, in Yucca Mountain. As Mr. Taco has already said, 25 years ago, uh, there were three sites proposed, one in the, the district of the uh, Speaker of the House, one in the district of the Majority Leader of the House, and then Yucca Mountain. Uh, Senator Reid now has a great deal of political influence, but at the time he was in his first year in the Senate. Uh, and, and as Mr. Tonko has said, uh, actually, he said f the phrase, the colloquial phrase at the time was forget Nevada. We all know what that really was. It wasn't forget. Um, I had a somewhat more sanitized version in my, um, my materials, which was screw Nevada. Um, but it was not a, a real scientifically um, pristine decision. It was always a decision that was filled with politics. So yes, we do need to have uh, more science and less politics in this decision. Uh, I hope we will get some of that in our uh, committee's deliberations uh, on this issue, but there is little to suggest it in today's hearing, uh, which seems to be taking place at a very odd time for a decision that will really uh, consider closely the science behind this decision. I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Miller. I think we have a unanimous consent request from Mr. Tonka. Mr. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, if uh, you would please yield to a moment of time. Without objection. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, as I'm sure you are aware, the uh, Washington Post is reporting that former member of Congress, uh, Howard Wolpe, passed away on Tuesday. Mr. Wolpe was a representative from the state of Michigan who served as chair of the INO subcommittee back in 1991 and 1992. He held many landmark hearings, and his investigative staff was top-notch. Uh, probably the one item that um, the representative uh, was very fondest of and uh, best remembered for was his work to stop the superconducting super collider project. Uh, representative Wolpe worked hard uh, and hand-in-hand -hand with his ranking minority member to stop that project, and their efforts saved taxpayers, in their opinion, at least $10 billion in construction costs and billions more 
and operating expenses. His record as INO chair stands among the strongest of any chair to serve in that role. In my new capacity on this subcommittee, uh, Mr. Chair, I look forward to emulating his bipartisan spirit and productive working relationship uh, that both he uh, and Mr. Bollert, uh, Representative Bollert from my region, uh, conducted. And uh, I appreciate you yielding me that time, and uh, we call to uh, mind and to memory uh, the service uh, of Representative Howard Wolfe. I Thank you, back. Mr. Tonkin. Pray for his families also. This time I would like to introduce our panel of witnesses. Our first witness is, is Mr. Jack Spencer, research fellow at the nuclear energy, uh, in nuclear energy policy at the Heritage Foundation. Our second witness is Dr. Peter Swift, distinguished member of the technical staff at Sandia National Laboratories. Dr. Swift has worked on geological disposal of radioactive waste since 1989. He worked on the waste isolation pilot plant project, that's hard for a southerner to say all those P's, from 1989 to 1998, and on the Yucca Mountain project since 1998, serving as the Yucca Mountain Lead Laboratory's chief scientist since 2006. A third witness is Dr. Roger Casperson, research professor and distinguished scientist at Clark University. Our fourth witness is Mr. Gary Hollis, is chairman of the Nyack County Board of County Commissioners. Yucca Mountain is located in his county in um, Nevada. Our fifth witness is Mr. Rick McLeod, uh, is that correct? Is that, okay, executive director of the Savannah River Site Community Reuse Organization. This SRS currently stores the second highest amount of high-level radioactive material in the country. Our final witness is Dr. Mark Peters, Deputy Laboratory Director for Programs at the Argonne National Laboratory. Dr. Peters previously served as Senior Scientific Advisor in the former Applied Science and Technology Directorate, where he supported the Director of the Office of Civilian Radioactive Waste Management. Dr. Peters also served as the Director of Program Development for Nuclear Waste Management Technical Work at the laboratory's former Chemical Engineering Division. Prior to joining Argonne, he was the Yucca Mountain Project Science and Engineering Testing Project Manager. As our witnesses should know, spoken testimony is limited to five minutes each, after which the members of the committee will have five minutes each to ask questions. Your written testimony will be included in the record of this hearing. It is the practice of the subcommittee on investigations and oversight to receive testimony under oath. Do any of you have any objection to taking an oath? Anybody? Please shake your head from side to side, or up and down, so I can see. Um, Dr. Casterson, do you have an objection? I don't see your head moving. Okay. Let the record reveal that all the witnesses are willing to take an oath. You may be represented by counsel. Do any of you have counsel here today? Anybody have counsel? Ms. Hollis? Dr. Casterson? Ms. Hollis? No. No counsel. Okay. Let the reflect, record reflect that the no, none of the witnesses have, have counsel. Now, if all of you would please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record reflect that all the witnesses participating have taken the oath. Please be seated. Those bells that you just heard was... Uh, the sign to us that we just started a vote for members edification we will go through as many opening statements as we can we will recess uh, to go for votes we'll recess at about five minutes so that everybody has time to get to the floor to vote and we'll reconvene at, with ten minutes after the last vote is called so please hurry back so we can get this hearing uh, finished and accomplished and hear from our witnesses get the questions. I now recognize our first witness, Mr. Spencer. You're recognized for five minutes. Please keep it within five minutes. And then if you can make it shorter, please do. Your full <laughs> testimony will be included in the record. All right. Well, we'll do what we can. Chairman Brown, 
and, and Harris, ranking members Tonko and Miller, and members of the subcommittees. My name is Jack Spencer. I am the research fellow for nuclear energy policy at the Heritage Foundation. The views, I, the views expressed in this testimony are my own and should not be construed as representing the official position of the Heritage Foundation. The Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982 attempted to establish a comprehensive disposal strategy for high-level nuclear waste. This strategy has failed. The government has spent billions of dollars without opening a repository, has yet to receive any waste, and is amassing billions of dollars in liability. The strategy codified in the Nuclear Waste Policy Act seemed straightforward and economically sound when it was developed in the early 1980s. It charged the federal government with disposing used nuclear fuel in Yucca Mountain and created a structure through which users of nuclear energy would pay a fee for that service. These payments would go to the Nuclear Waste Fund, which the federal government could access through congressional appropriations. What has been, become clear over time, however, is that this approach was wrought with problems. Nonetheless, it continued to inch forward, providing some confidence that the nation was moving toward a nuclear waste management solution. The Obama administration's anti-Yucca policy, however, has destroyed any such notion. The combination of the federal government's historical ineptness and this administration's actions has undermined all confidence in Washington's ability to meet its legal nuclear waste obligations. To restore this confidence, the Obama administration established the Blue Ribbon Commission on America's Nuclear Future to develop a new strategy. Though the administration's actions had added substantial uncertainty to an already unpredictable federal policy on nuclear waste, it does provide an opportunity to bring about reform, the reform necessary to get America's nuclear waste policy on track. Unfortunately, the BRC's recommendations as currently drafted will not achieve this because it accepts the basic tenets of the current system. That is, that the federal government should be responsible for nuclear waste management and that these activities should be financed through a flat fee largely disconnected from any actual service. Accepting this leads to recommendations that focus more on symptoms than on the underlying flaws. These basic flaws are that, one, waste producers are relieved of their responsibility for waste management. This structure misaligns incentives, responsibilities, and authorities. And secondly, that there is no specific price for specific services rendered. Accurate pricing is critical to any efficient marketplace. Nonetheless, the BRC does provide a framework that, with modification, could yield long-term solutions. For example, the BRC proposes that, the fe that a federal corporation be responsible for nuclear waste management. Simply moving a function from one government agency to another only perpetuates existing deficiencies. This approach essentially blames current problems on the federal bureaucracy when the actual problem is relegating a commercial activity to a government entity. A better approach is to use the federal corporation to facilitate the transfer of responsibility for nuclear waste management to the private sector. To achieve this, the corporation's responsibility should be limited to disposing of existing nuclear waste and should get access to the approximately $25 billion paid into the Nuclear Waste Fund to fund its activities. Once this is complete, the corporation should be dissolved or privatized. Moving forward, waste, the waste disposal fee should be repealed and waste producers should manage their own waste. Utilities would then bear the responsibility and have the freedom to choose how to best manage their waste. This could include direct disposal, reprocessing, or some combination thereof. The federal role would be to set and enforce regulatory standards. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit about nuclear waste finance. The BRC correctly spent significant effort on how to finance nuclear waste management. It recommended paying nuclear waste fees into, an es into escrow accounts. Only that amount appropriated by Congress would be paid to the tre Treasury. Though this would protect fees from being used to fund other government priorities, currently a major problem, it, fails, it falls short of the reform necessary. A better approach would mandate that nuclear utilities place in escrow adequate funds to dispose of waste stored on site. This would eliminate the federal role in waste financing, ensure that utilities have access to the funds that they have set aside for waste disposal, and protect taxpayers by guaranteeing adequate disposal funds will be available if a plant ever goes out of business. The final area I'd like to address is geologic storage. Unfortunately, the Secretary of Energy directed the BRC to rule out any consideration of Yucca Mountain. Luckily, the BRC charter makes no such prohibitions. Indeed, it does the opposite by directing the BRC to consider all options. The reality is, is that neither the BRC nor anyone else can make a truly informed decision on Yucca because the NRC has stopped work on the DOE's application to construct the repository and refuses to release the NRC technical staff's findings regarding the application. Therefore, the most important 
recommendation the BRC should make is to demand that the NRC complete the Yucca application and publicly release all data generated by the application process. Whether or not the Yucca repository is ever built, the NRC's completed review process will yield unique information that has important future relevance. That concludes my testimony. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Spencer. We'll, uh, Dr. Swift, I understand you have a fairly short testimony. We need to get to the floor, so go ahead, if you would, with your oral testimony. You recognize it. Thank you. Chairman Brown, Chairman Harris, Ranking Members Tonko and Miller, and the distinguished members of the committee, thank you. I'm Dr. Peter Swift from Sandia National Laboratories. In your letter requesting my testimony, you asked me to address three topics. First, you asked me to provide my views on the draft recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Commission regarding the need for a permanent geological repository. Second, you asked me to describe my role as the chief scientist for the Yucca Mountain Lead Laboratory. And third, you asked me to describe the various scientific issues and technical conclusions in the DOE's license application for the proposed Yucca Mountain Repository. I'll start with the second and third questions, and I'll close with my views on the Blue Ribbon Commission's draft recommendation. I'm speaking only for myself. Anything I say here today represents my own personal beliefs and does not necessarily represent the position of Sandia National Laboratories or the U.S. Department of Energy. Specifically, I am not here to amend or to add to Sandia's technical position with respect to the Yucca Mountain license application. That position remains unchanged from its documentation in the application. I'm a geologist by training. And I've worked for the last 22 years studying how deep geologic repositories for radioactive waste will perform over hundreds of thousands of years. In my role as the uh, chief scientist for the Yucca Mountain Lead Laboratory team, I focused on ensuring the integrity and credibility of a scientific basis for the post-closure portions of a license application that the DOE submitted in June 2008. I was extensively involved in interactions with external and internal technical review and oversight groups, and I had a significant role in preparing the application and presenting it to the NRC. The development of a technical basis for the repository was the work of hundreds of scientists and engineers spread over decades. When I speak about the work contained in the license application, I'm summarizing the contributions of multiple experts who prepared those sections. What types of political science, of, sorry, of post-closure scientific issues does the application consider? The detailed analyses presented in the application focus on those processes that have a significant potential to affect long-term performance of the repository. But all, all relevant events and processes, including those that are highly unlikely and those that are shown to have little or no impact on the system, are summarized in the application and evaluated in detail in supporting documents. Subsections of the application address each of the major processes affecting the repository, including, for example, climate change, groundwater flow, long-term degradation of the waste packages. As required by EPA and NRC regulations, analyses provide an estimate of the mean annual radiation dose that a person living in the vicinity might receive at any time in the next million years. One of the main conclusions of these analyses is that estimated releases in radiation doses to hypothetical future humans are well below the EPA and NRC standards. Overall, the application concludes that there is a significant, sorry, a sufficient technical basis for the NRC to issue a license authorizing construction of the facility. This conclusion was a fundamental basis for the 2008 submittal of the application to the NRC for review. This brings me to my views on the Blue Ribbon Commission's draft recommendation regarding the need for a permanent geological repository. The Commission observed in their draft report that, quote, every foreseeable approach to the nuclear fuel cycle still requires a means of disposal that assures the very long-term isolation of radioactive wastes. I agree with this observation. Alternative approaches to nuclear fuel cycle that involve separating and recycling fissile material and irradiated fuel can change the type and character of waste requiring geologic disposal, but they will not eliminate the need. The Commission also concluded in its draft report that, quote, deep geological disposal is the most promising and accepted method currently available. The Commission further noted that disposal could occur either in mined repositories or potentially in deep boreholes. Again, I agree. Research to date in the United States and elsewhere provides confidence that safe and effective disposal facilities could be designed and operated in a range of geologic settings. 
recognizing that there is much to be done to establish the scientific and technical basis for licensing any of the disposal concepts available to us, and also recognizing that the regulatory process essential to ensuring public health and safety may be time consuming, I strongly support the Blue Ribbon Commission's draft recommendation for, quote, prompt efforts to develop one or more geologic disposal facilities. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Swift. We've got to go to the floor to vote, so the committee will now stand in recess until 10 minutes after the last vote. Reconvene the joint committee meeting. Now I recognize our next witness. Thank you, all of you, for your uh, indulgence in this vote uh, series. Appreciate y'all staying around. And um, our next witness is Dr. Casperson. Doctor, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, in 2001. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences uh, published a, a major report that represented both a, an unusually large committee for the Academy and, and also a rather substantial period of time with international representation of leading world scientists as, as well as uh, prominent engineers and scientists in the United States. And uh, I want to indicate what all that work uh, resulted in an observation by the, um, by the panel in its report that um, despite the conversations we may have here today and what will go on about Yucca Mountain and so forth, the major issues are really not geology. Uh, there are a number of ge geological options that would probably work uh, quite well, and the failures and challenges that we're seeing are really connected, as the Academy noted, uh, in achieving the sort of people-related problems, the societal nature of the issues that are involved. And um, so... While you all have the responsibility of, of, um, of designing the next steps in, in our national efforts to deal with, with uh, radioactive waste, um, uh, you're going to need to give a lot of attention to issues that have been quite neglected in the past. Uh, I might remind you, I've been around long enough to know that uh, Elvin Weinberg, who was a very prominent scientists involved in the early history of ra radioactive waste management noted that the problem that uh, he had most underestimated were connected with waste storage and waste disposal and particularly the public interactions that occurred. Um, now there is, uh, if we're honest about it, there are some pretty serious problems to be dealt with in, in trying to come up with, with um, a new program for radioactive waste. And I've noted some of them here that uh, they're what some of us might call deep uncertainty problems, uh, that when you're talking about uh, situations where you have really long time frames at 10,000 and 100,000 years, and we don't know what the future of technology and society is going to look at, uh, that there are site-specific problems connected with any site that can be uh, reviewed and considered uh, as a repository site. And so there are things connected with future populations, lifestyles and values, health and medical issues, and even the political context itself. Um, where we really can't predict very well what's going to happen. And that has implications, I think, for whatever administration takes this problem on, they're going to have to deal with some of these, some of these issues, and they're not easy issues. Um, also, we might note that we've never done a, you know, uh, uh, really a high-level 
waste or spent fuel repository before. So uh, it'll be a first of a kind facility. There are also not facilities that exist anywhere in the world at the moment. Uh, so our experience is limi limited. And so we need to understand that somehow the management process is going to need to be evolutionary because that will be the nature of knowledge will be evolutionary and these uncertainties are going to change over, uh, over time. Uh, now what I, I do want to focus on particularly is the problem of, of uh, social trust. Um, some of you may have seen in yesterday's New York Times on the front page that uh, a new New York Times uh, CBS uh, national poll has discovered that social trust has reached, um, it has been, we've been experiencing a long-term erosion in social trust in our country. And um, uh, in the last uh, few weeks, it's hit the low point that has existed at any time in the last 20 or 30 years. Um, the loss of trust is particularly pronounced in the nuclear area, but we must understand that it really cuts across and it's, and it's generally respons responsible and found uh, elsewhere in many other institutions. In other words, the social pr trust problem is not just a matter of getting the nuclear things right because it is a general problem in our society, and there's been a loss of social trust in institutions, in corporations, in Congress, regrettably, in the presidency, and so forth. And those things are, and it's not one particular poll, because we now have evidence drawn from a number of different surveys that basically indicate that. And I'm just about out of time. Um, Uh, just to indicate, um, I can probably give you only one piece of social science uh, research. We actually have a large body of, of evidence which has been accumulated um, uh, among scientists and researchers over the last 20 years. This is one example drawn from work by psychologists, and you'll see in the upper part of this diagram those are a whole, don't worry about reading all those things, there are a whole list of actions that can be taken that ought to build trust. And the lower part of the diagram is actions that are taken and events that happen that lose trust. Look at the size of the bars involved. And what we found, and I'll just state it and, and maybe I'll end there, that, um, um, that what we think is that social trust is easily lost and very difficult to recover. And so one of the things that's going to be faced in Yucca Mountain or in the next phase of the radioactive waste problem is, is how do we deal with social trust? And if you're dealing with a very feared hazard and one that concerns the public and the social trust in managers is very low, you've got a real problem to deal with. And we're going to need to give that a lot of thought in designing the process of moving forward for radioactive waste. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Mr. Hollis, you are recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I am Gary Hollis, Nye County, uh, I'm chairman of the Nye County Board of Commissioners. In July of 2002, Congress designated Nye County as the site for nuclear waste repository in accordance with the provision of the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, the law Congress uh, enacted to establish our nation's policy on high-level radioactive waste. The act gives Nye County the authority to oversee federal activities on the repository. It is a duty that I and my fellow commissioners take very seriously. We have worked with DOE on the science we have participated in the licensing and carefully followed the deliberation of the Blue Ribbon Commission. The Nuclear Waste Policy Act is clear. It sets out a process to determine if the repository can be built safely. And in 2008, the DOE submitted a licensing application to the NRC 
with the assurance that it could be built safely. Two years later, they asked to withdraw that application. There is no need for the BRC to make alternatives to Yucca Mountain. DOE, NRC, and the Obama administration should comply with the law or change it. Nye County has uh, been fully engaged with the BRC. We are disappointed that the draft report implies there is no local support in Nevada. When it insists that the siting of any repository have the consent of local government and communities. Mr. Chairman, Yucca Mountain has local support. If the NRC determines it is unsafe to build this repository, Nye County would, would oppose its construction. If it is found to be safe, we favor its construction. In a very real sense, Nye County is the only community close to Yucca Mountain. At least six rural Nevada counties support continuing the licensing application process to determine the Yuc that Yucca Mountain can be built safely. The landmass of these counties taken together is larger than many states. By any reasonable geographic uh, definition, Yucca Mountain has the support of the surrounding communities. The DOE, the ERDA, and the AEC spent many years attempting to cite a ge geological repository. The current language in the NWPA has a compromise by Congress to deal with the local uh, support issue, but it also has set up procedures to follow if no local support is found. In other words, Congress carefully considered the possibility that the repository could have to be built despite state or local opposition. Congress determined that the building the repository was the, uh, the national pro uh, priority and should take, uh, uh, should proceed without, uh, despite local uh, condition. Mr. Chairman, the state of Nevada currently opposes Yucca Mountain. However, in 1975, the Nevada legislator, uh, legislature passed a resolution that said, in part, and I quote, the legislature of the state of Nevada strongly urges the Energy Research and Development Administration to choose the Nevada test site for the storage and processing of nuclear material. In 1987, the state legislature created Bullfrog County that completely enclosed Yucca Mountain with the intent to control the receipts of the benefits of payment. The point is, the state of Nevada at one time was not opposed to dealing with nuclear waste. Follow the money. It will take decades to study, license, and build something other than Yucca Mountain. What if we do not find a willing state? What happens if a state changes its mind? Would the fate of the repository be in jeopardy every, uh, at every election? <clears throat> Would that violate the consent basis goal? The draft report does not answer these questions. Finally, Mr. Chairman, as I said earlier, we take our uh, site county responsibility seriously we conducted a robust science program to determine if the repository could be built safely. Uh, to this date, our studies have shown that the repository can be built safely, but we want an additional confidence that a complete license process will provide. To ignore the science, the law, the, the, and facts, not to mention the administration's scientific integrity policy, because the BRC says Yucca Mountain does not have local support is an insult to the process and contrary to the rule of law. Yucca Mountain does have local support. My presence here today confirms that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hollis. Mr. McLeod, you are recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman Brown and Harris and members of the committee, 
Thank you for the opportunity to testify today regarding the draft recommendations of the President's Blue Ribbon Commission on American's Nuclear Future. I am Rick McLeod, Executive Director of the Savannah Riverside Community Reuse Organization, or SRSCRO. The SRSCRO is a nonprofit regional group supporting economic diversification and job creation in the five county region of Georgia and South Carolina, near the Department of Energy, Savannah Riverside, or SRS. Our organization is unique across the DOE complex in that our area of interest covers multiple counties and two states. We have prepared extended remarks for inclusion in the record, but during my time today, I would like to focus briefly on four of the Blue Ribbon Commission's draft recommendations. Let me preface my remarks by saying that the individuals and groups I represent in South Carolina and Georgia continue to believe that the administration's decision to halt work on Yucca Mountain is wrong-headed and counter to the nation's long-term best interests. We applaud congressional efforts, including those of this committee, specifically the June 2011 report on Yucca Mountain, to scrutinize the administration's actions with respect to Yucca Mountain and the lack of scientific integrity, openness, and transparency in its determination to terminate the project. Now to the Commission's recommendations. We fully agree with recommendation number one, which calls for a consent-based, transparent, and science-based approach to nuclear waste management solutions. If a science-based approach were followed, we'd be completing the Yucca Mountain Project today. We're on record multiple times with our strongly held concerns about high-level defense waste continuing to be stored at the Savannah River site with no disposition path available and by default becoming the de facto Yucca Mountain. On the following point, we want to be extremely clear. In its final report, the Blue Ribbon Commission needs to decouple high-level defense waste from commercial spent fuel. The defense waste is different. The quantity is different. The number of locations affected is different. The potential for future use is different. The legal and financial implications for the government are different. Specific separate recommendations are needed for disposition of high-level defense waste and for commercial spent fuel. Second, we share the view of those who fear that forming some type of federal corporation dedicated to managing nuclear waste could further delay efforts to dispose of the waste, especially defense waste, which has no other disposition path than a geologic repository. Rather than create a new organization, why not simply focus for a shorter period and for less money on just disposing of the waste? We need solutions, not more bureaucracy. While we appreciate the need for interim storage, our concerns center on the term interim when it comes to nuclear waste, this is a relative term that is almost never associated with a fixed time frame. Rather, it can mean anything from 10 years to 500 years or more. Interim needs to be clearly and legally defined before communities such as ours can begin to address the potential and advisability of such storage. In any event, our community would not support interim storage scenario of commercial spent fuel at the Savannah River site unless a permit solution is pursued at the same time. This means progress towards a permit repository for both high-level defense waste and commercial spent fuel and or a program to reprocess or recycle commercial used nuclear fuel. Commun community support also requires removal of a sufficient quantity of waste currently stored at SRS and the recommitment of processing new used nuclear fuel currently stored at SRS storage pools. These two conditions, along with ongoing health and safety monitoring, proper regulatory oversight, both at the local and state level, and a legally binding commitment to a final disposition plan are essential to community support for an interim storage option. Finally, we strongly urge the Blue Ribbon Commission to amend this recommendation number seven to specifically recognize the critical role of H Canyon at the Savannah River site in international nonproliferation efforts. H Canyon, as you know, is a one-of-a-kind facility of immense importance to DOE and the nation. In our view, it is imperative to reinstate H Canyon to operational status, fully funded and fully staffed. I thank the committee for its oversight and contribution to the National Dialogue, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. McLeod. And if any member of the uh, committee would like some interpretation and uh, 
Mr. McLeod and I would be glad to interpret each other for y'all. So <laughs> thank you, Mr. McLeod. I appreciate your testimony. Dr. Peters, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. I would like to thank uh, Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Tonko, and members of the Subcommittee on Investigations and Oversight, also Chairman Harris, Ranking Member Miller, and Representative Biggert, and the other members of the Subcommittee on Energy and Environment for the opportunity to testify this morning. My name is Mark Peters, and I'm the Deputy Laboratory Director for Programs at Argonne National Laboratory. Mr. Chairman, I ask that my full written testimony be entered into the record, and I will summarize it here. I am honored to be here today to testify about science and technology challenges and opportunities associated with the nuclear fuel cycle, the need to develop new sustainable technologies to enable America's nuclear energy future, and finally, my perspectives on the BRC draft recommendations. For decades, the United States has grappled with the multiple challenges of crafting a long-term solution for the management of legacy and future used nuclear fuel. Over this past year, these persistent challenges have taken on new urgency as the accident at Japan's Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant has focused international attention on the safety and security of used nuclear fuel storage. Today, as we consider the BRC's draft recommendations, it is critically important for us to take a close look at the many challenges that, challenges that must be addressed if we are to succeed in managing our used nuclear fuel. I concur with the BRC's draft recommendation to move forward expeditiously with siting, licensing, and operating a storage and disposal system to manage legacy and future used nuclear fuel. I believe this is an important and necessary step toward enabling a sustainable nuclear energy future. A storage and disposal system is required in any nuclear fuel cycle. I also strongly support the BRC recommendation to conduct a robust advanced fuel cycle R&D program to inform future domestic fuel cycle options and maintain U.S. leadership in the global nuclear energy and fuel cycle enterprise. Yet, while I understand the BRC's conclusion that it is premature, premature to seek consensus on the policy question of whether the U.S. should commit to closing the fuel cycle, I believe the BRC's omission of this issue will result in a missed opportunity to inform our nuclear waste policy going forward. Given the necessary linkages between fuel cycle technologies and ultimate disposition of nuclear waste, I believe it is vital to make advanced nuclear fuel cycle R&D a critical component of our long-term strategy for nuclear waste management, and that our national strategy must simultaneously address issues of economics, uranium resource utilization, nuclear waste minimization, and a strengthened nonproliferation regime. This is an increasingly urgent issue. At present, nuclear energy is the sole proven, reliable, abundant, affordable, and carbon-free source of electricity generation for the U.S. and the world. Our current nuclear generating cap capacity is not sufficient to support the goals of our energy system going forward. Additionally, most existing nuclear power plants in the U.S. will reach the end of their operating licenses in the next few decades. So we must work swiftly and urgently to extend, replace, and add to the nuclear energy generating capacity in the United States. To a great extent, our future capacity for nuclear energy generation will depend on our ability to safely dispose of nuclear waste, and perhaps even more importantly, to assure the public of the safety and security of our used nuclear fuel. Failure to find new workable solutions to the continuing problem of nuclear waste management will have serious long-term ramifications for our national economy and future global competitiveness. Real technological process in addressing these challenges is possible only within the context of a thoughtful, consistent policy for nuclear waste management, one that acknowledges the reality that a once-through fuel cycle may not be sustainable if global nuclear energy generation increases substantially. Our national policy must include substantial support for an advanced fuel cycle R&D program that is focused on outcomes, that is closely integrated with storage and disposal efforts, and that ultimately leads to down selection, demonstration, and deployment of effective advanced fuel cycle technologies. To that end, the U.S. should conduct a science-based advanced nuclear fuel cycle research development and demonstration program to, evalu to evaluate recycling, transmutation, and disposal technologies that minimize proliferation, environmental, health, and safety risks. This program should be carried out through robust public-private partnerships involving the Department of Energy, its national laboratories, universities, and industry, and it should be conducted with a sense of urgency and purpose. My written testimony provides a more specific set of recommendations to advance nuclear fuel cycle R&D. I thank you, and I would be pleased to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Dr. Peters. I thank the panel for y'all's testimony. Reminding members that committee rules limit questioning to five minutes, the chair at this point will open the first round of questions. The chair recognizes himself for five minutes. Mr. McLeod, in your opinion, does the demand 
of the Secretary of Energy that BRC exclude Yucca in its deliber deliberations to track from its ability to develop the best possible recommendations for nuclear waste management? Uh, yes, sir, Congressman, we do. We believe that is fact. We also believe that they could uh, – we know eventually there's going to have to be another repository as well. We can move first with Yucca Mountain and then start work on a second one. Um, and as I stated in our testimony, uh, the written testimony, we also believe that may be one of the missing recommendations from this report is where is the recommendation to utilize Yucca Mountain. Very good. Thank you. Dr. Swift, please summarize the scientific evaluation of Yucca Mountain that – you led for Sandia in the Department of Energy. How many years was the site studied? Can you describe some of the issues considered? Hydrology, seismic activity, the robustness of engineering barrier, engineered barriers, and what was found? Ultimately, what was concluded regarding the site's suitability and its ability to meet NRC safety recommendations and requirements? Thank you. Certainly. The uh, the site was studied from the early 1980s until the time the license application was submitted. Work continued after the submittal of the license application uh, in response to questions received from the NRC. Just in terms of the one way to look at it is the volume of the work, the uh, page count. The application was about 8,000 pages, 8,600. Uh, another 196 documents went with it. These were not simple documents. These were thick technical reports, maybe 50,000, 60,000 pages total. Uh, the types of topics that were addressed, uh, from a, a technical point of view, we saw our responsibility to evaluate essentially everything that was potentially relevant. So uh, we cataloged what might happen, the potentially relevant things, and uh, including things that were on the face of them, probably not relevant, but for completeness, there they were. Changes in sea level, the effects of future changes in sea level, for example. Uh, effects of uh, erosion at the land surface well above where the, the waste would be buried. Uh, seismic effects, the effects of possible volcanism at the site. Each of these ends up with a, I mean, we, a, a detailed technical analysis, specialists focusing on it, focusing on it sometimes for years. Uh, the whole other processes, uh, groundwater flow, transport of radionuclides in the groundwater away from the site, uh, the way radionuclides might be taken up in the biosphere through potential pathways for human exposure in the future, uh, the treatment of uncertainty that uh, Professor Casperson mentioned. Uh, in all of this, we did attempt to estimate the range of uncertainty in our knowledge or understanding of those physical processes. Uh, and that would be incorporated into uh, why I refer to it as an estimate, not a prediction of the future. We, it, it's an estimate based on our understanding of the uncertainty. Uh, and I think you asked for the, the conclusions of it. Again, I, as I said in, the, in my testimony, uh, uh, we concluded with, with good confidence that the site would perform uh, well, that it would meet the NRC and EPA requirements, that uh, the, the two things, the primary measures that the regulations judge on would be the releases from the site into groundwater and the potential doses to humans. Those were both well below regulatory limits. Very good, sir. Thank you. Mr. Hollis, the state of Nevada currently opposes the repository at Yucca Mountain. You're very clear that your local community does ardently support it being there. One of the primary recommendations from the draft of the Blue Ribbon Commission report was that any repository should have local support. Why does Nevada oppose the Yucca Mountain project, yet your county favors it, and how do you define consent-based siting and local support? Mr. Chairman, um, I think one of the big things is uh, people calling it a dump. Uh, if you go out and and ask people, do you favor a, a radioactive uh, repos or a radioactive site that it's a dump? You're going to get no. I don't want it. If you was to ask them, do you want a, a repository to keep a radioactive source safe? You'll probably get a yes. Most people keep their money in banks. Banks are a repository. That's what this facility is. 
a repository to keep something safe. And as far as the consent basis program, the Blue Ribbon Commission didn't, a didn't a answer any question. What if the st a state doesn't, or, or in, no state wants uh, the repository? That's the reason Congress had a provision in there that Congress would vote on it after a dis disapproval by the state. Very good. My uh, time has expired now. I recognize the ranking member Tonko for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Dr. Casperson, um, could you briefly tell us about the role of politics in the 1987 decision to designate Yucca Mountain as a uh, permanent repository for waste? history of radioactive waste management, not only in the United States but elsewhere, um, has indicated that it's never been a purely scientific process anywhere, as far as I know. And there's always been a mixture of politics and, and, um, uh, and science and interaction between the two. In particular, in 1987, um, a concern that I think went through the scientific community as well as people in Nevada. By the way, I also don't like the uh, terminology of, of calling a repository a dump, but I don't think we fixed the problem by changing the name. Anyhow, um, uh, in, in the case of, of the 1987 amendments, what happened in effect was that uh, although a commitment had been made in the, um, in the original Nuclear Waste Policy Act uh, to have a competitive process, if you will, uh, about characterizing the technical qualities and quality assurance and risks associated with, with uh, sites, a decision was made basically to make the choice uh, prior to the scientific work being completed. And that was a major problem in a loss of uh, social trust and in polarizing um, uh, the local uh, people of Nevada. There have been other issues like this, for example, in the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, uh, fairness. They tr actually, Congress, I think, tried very hard on, in that legislation to achieve fairness of, of uh, process. And subsequently, the president uh, simply eliminated the Eastern Repository uh, as, as, as basically a political move, I think, primarily uh, uh, be because of the uh, dangers that were represented in the election going on at that time. Mm -hmm. Now, even if the geology and the, uh, and the climate, for instance, were perfect or are perfect, which some dispute. Um, Yucca has been a political failure with, you know, then uh, presidential candidate uh, Senator Obama promising to close it. Now leading Republican candidates for the presidency are making that same sort of pledge. And we hear about the vast number of Nevadans who oppose, you know, hosting that uh, repository. Are there any lessons that you can cite for us, uh, Dr. Casperson, from the failure that can be used to guide future citing uh, processes? Well, let me indicate one, one example. I spent some time in Sweden uh, earlier, um, uh, in the early years of this uh, century, and had some contact with, with their process there. And the Swedes really take a rather different approach than we've taken, and I think it's a lesson uh, from both the process going on in Sweden and a lesson from Yucca Mountain that if you really rely upon coercion rather than on uh, trying to achieve a high degree of voluntary consent, you're going to find yourself in a war with with local states, and and I think a number of us wrote in the 1980s that um, that we already had learned enough about radioactive uh, waste management to know that that uh, if you had to deal with trying to coerce an unwilling state with an active and talented attorney general, 
you are going to have a major problem in winning over consent. And the polarization that has happened in Nevada is, I think, a good lesson that um, we ought to try to do more of what the Swedes have done of achieving a high degree of uh, voluntary consent, taking things off the agenda that local people are concerned about, and moving that whole process along, greasing the wheels rather than, than um, uh, producing the backs up of, of uh, local people. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Tonko. Uh, now I recognize my fellow subcommittee chairman, Dr. Harris, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to get back to you know talking about the science of uh, Yucca Mountain. We've spent, uh, as I said in my opening statement, billions of dollars, many of years studying it. And all the science that we're aware of right now says that the nuclear waste can be stored there safely. But much of that scientific eff uh, effort and, and data is being blocked from public view because the NRC simply refuses to release the safety reports as scientists repaired and uh, refuses to complete its review of the Yucca Mountain license application. In fact, Chairman Hall, Dr. Brown, and myself have sent multiple letters to the NRC at demanding release of this information and action on the license. I want to ask the panel, and I can begin with Mr. Spencer, how important is it for the NRC to finalize and release its scientific reviews of the site, that is, the safety evaluation reports? Uh, can any of you think of any reason why you'd want to withhold any of that from the public, um, stonewall this? And uh, what does the continued suppression of those reports mean with respect to the scientific integrity goals and guidelines that uh, this administration, uh, you know, to their credit, regularly talk about, but, you know, we would like to actually see it in action. Uh, so, Mr. Spencer. Um, as I testified today and have written extensively on in the past, I think it's absolutely critical that all that information be made available, if for no other reason, um, notwithstanding whether we ever build the repository or not, um, to allow us all to make the most informed decisions possible about Yucca Mountain. Um, in addition to that, the fact is we've spent, as a country, $15 billion characterizing that, pro that, that project. Um, there simply is no good reason not to allow all the information relevant to that project um, be shown the light of day so that we can make our determinations on that. Um, Thank you. Dr. Swift, any reasons you can think of not to do it? I want to uh, thank you for the question. I, I want to emphasize the importance of the role of the regulator in this process. I asserted earlier that I believe the site meets those regulations. The test of that is when a regulator find, makes that finding. It, I, as a scientist, don't actually make a decision here. I inform a decision, and we do have a process here which the decision uh, is up to the, the regulator, a, a lengthy and detailed process to be followed. Uh, Yes, I, I see value in following that process. And that, and Mr. McLeod? I'll give a short answer. Yes, they should release the report. No, no reason you can think of where we should hide any of that from the public? No reason. Okay. Dr. Peters? Yeah, I, I, w I would agree. I would like to see it released. The, the, the reason I would also like to see it released is because of, regardless of whether we move forward with Yucca Mountain, we've got to develop a repository. So there's a tremendous amount to learn from understanding what what, what we've done so what far, we've done so far and Here. what the regulator said about the license application. Thank you. Um, let me just um, uh, ask two other uh, very short questions. One is, is that, you know, uh, Dr. Caspers, I appreciate you, your point about, you know, coercion versus voluntary consent. That's important. But right next to you is Mr. Hollis. I mean, he, he lives in the area. His family drinks the water, breathes the air, and he's here. He doesn't look coerced to me. So uh, I'm going to ask you, Mr. Hollis, um, you know, according to your testimony, you've, Nye County has done some scientific investigation, according to your written testimony. And based on that, I mean, do you need to be coerced or are you, you know, looking at the data, looking at what the county itself looked at, you want to be neighbors with this facility? Absolutely. Uh, uh, we, we've had a really good uh, uh, relationship with the Department of Energy until uh, about two years ago, three years ago. Um, then they started shutting down the program. Uh, the cooperation kind of went blank. And uh, they don't talk to us much anymore. But your, your testimony is that the, the county most affected and the people most affected, and it's ne it'll never be everyone, but they want this to go forward, at least to, to c complete the investigation. Absolutely. Uh, uh, I have... I don't get calls on, on Yucca Mountain. 
Uh, I get more right. more uh, phone calls on dogs and cats than sure. I do. No, I, I appreciate sure. that being a local elected official. I appreciate that. Dr. Swift, I just want to uh, uh, ask you one question because I understand the DOE has asked Sandy to begin review of deep borehole methods versus uh, uh, other methods of disposal. Uh, can you just briefly discuss the advantage or disadvantage of the deep borehole methods? And uh, then, of course, whether or not, uh, because one of the conditions is supposed to be retrievable, is whether or not that's accomplishable with a deep borehole method. With respect to that last point first, if, if, if permanent disposal is not what you intend, a deep borehole probably is not the preferred option. Uh, there are ways okay. to retrieve things out of a deep borehole. Uh, the oil industry, for example, can retrieve things from quite surprising depths out of a hole. But no, you're making it harder on yourself there. Uh, the, the premise of the concept is that you drill a relatively large diameter hole, uh, say a half a meter in diameter, uh, to maybe a five kilometer depth uh, into, into bedrock, crystalline bedrock. And you use the lower two kilometers of the hole for disposal, and that gives you a very long column to seal it. Uh, it's a very long transport pathway for radioactive material to come back out. Uh, that the, the premise is, is straightforward. Uh, it, the technology is within reach now. It's, it's there now to implement it. There's work to be done to demonstrate that uh, seal technology would work, that the permeability of bedrock at that depth is as low as we think it is. There, there's work to be done. And just out of curiosity, and I know I'm a little over time, about how many of these boreholes would you need for the current nuclear waste we have? It seems like you'd need a lot. Uh, Any the, idea? Yes, we, 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 we looked at that. Uh, with, without reconsolidating waste, we're just taking the fuel assemblies mm -hmm. as they exist today, uh, the entire projected inventory from the current fleet of 104 uh, commercial reactors uh, would fit in under probably under a thousand boreholes. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you, Dr. Harris. The chair now recognizes Mr. Miller for five minutes. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Casterson. I had the experience a couple of years ago of uh, of living through a proposal to um, locate a facility in my district that initially everyone was for, uh, and by the time it was done, uh, hardly anyone was for. It was a a biological research center. It was to move the Plum Island facility from Plum Island. Um, supposedly the decision to site it there in the first place was always uh, completely political. There was a provision written into the law that required that it be on an island, um, supposedly to contain foot and mouth disease, but um, supposedly that was always just to make sure it went to Plum Island and had no scientific basis. Uh, initially, everyone saw it as uh, research, great jobs, was all for it. The county commissioners of that county were, was for it. Uh, everybody nearby was for it. NC State was for it. Duke was for it. Carolina was for it. Everybody was for it. Uh, over the course of several public hearings, um, all public support for it in Granville County deteriorated. Uh, and eventually, the county commissioners reversed their positions. And at that point, I reversed my position from having supported local government's desire to bring it into their county to not supporting bringing a facility to a county that did, in my district that did not want it. Um, how would the NBATH, it was called NBATH, that's an acronym for something, um, how did bringing the, how did the siting decision for NBATH compare to the Yucca Mountain decision? Are you familiar with both processes? Uh, no, I'm really not. Um, but I might, might make one observation. Um, uh, that we've been looking with interest on uh, the siting of uh, wind energy facilities in the United right. States. Um, and everybody agrees in principle, at first everybody favors it, and they agree in principle that wind energy is a fairly benign energy source as compared with nuclear and coal and, and, uh, and so forth. But we also know that in many of these cases, what starts, what you're seeing in that particular facility is something that occurs in, in many places, that people start off very positive about it. As they learn more and as issues are raised about it and, and risks get onto the agenda and, and become discussed, that uh, people's fears and concerns tend to take over. In the uh, in the process, and many of these situations end up 
with people quite negative, and I think it's become really difficult for hazardous facilities, hazardous industrial facilities, and energy facilities very generally, even when they're as benign as, as wind energy and solar uh, units, for example, to cite any of those things. And the Cape Wind case, which you may be familiar uh, with, is a good illustration of, of this, where there's been a 10-year fight uh, about establishing offshore um, wind turbines. Um, okay. but, uh, Mr. Hollis, you testified that there is support in your county that would actually be the, uh, the Yucca Mountain facility would actually be in your county and that folks in your county do support it, see it as bringing jobs, economic activity. Um, and um, as I said in my opening statement, though, this, this high-level nuclear waste, although there are concerns enough about keeping it someplace safely for 10,000 years, you've got to get it there first. Um, and it will not magically appear uh, at Yucca Mountain. Um, and uh, all the rail lines, all of the roads that it would likely travel th um, through on to get to your, to your county, to the Yucca Fountain facility, uh, go through Las Vegas. Um, and what is the population of your county and what is the population of Las Vegas and would there be any jobs associated with having high-level nuclear waste coming through Las Vegas on roads or on rail? Well, I, I have shipments of, of waste going to the test site uh, pretty much every day and none of that waste goes through Las Vegas. Um, all of it goes around Las Vegas mm -hmm. into to Knight County and to the test site. Okay. Um, my, my understanding is that 80,000 shipments a year would go through Clark County through Las Vegas. As far as I know, none of the shipments would, would, would go through downtown Las Vegas. Downtown Las Vegas, how about Clark County? Uh, there might be a, a few shipments that, that, that would come in from uh, down in uh, toward California, but uh, as far as I know, all of it, uh, well, there might be some coming across the little piece of, of, of Clark County going into Lincoln County, but uh, most of it would go uh, all right. around Clark County. Clark, Clark has been designated as an affected area. Why, why is Clark County designated as an affected area? Well, I, I, I think it's an effective area. Uh, we used it as a, a affected local uh, units of government because it was uh, uh, designated at one time to uh, to uh, have uh, uh, transportation, but there's never been any transportation of uh, that I know of nuclear uh, uh, waste going through uh, Clark County. All the nuclear waste comes through Nye County, I, and I get it from every which way, no matter if it comes east, west, north, or south. It has to go to Nye County. Jim's time's expired, and I. Chairman now recognizes uh, Ms. Biggert for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for holding this hearing. I wish that this wasn't kind of the getaway date uh, because I think this is a very important hearing, and we really could spend a lot more time, I think, than, than, than we have today. Uh, but uh, Dr. Peters, uh, um, you've been at Argonne, and, and we've and, and since I've been in Congress, we've gone through electrometallurgic uh, process, we've gone through the pyro processing, we've gone through the, the reprocessing, reprocessing, and now we're, we're talking about uh, recycling. And uh, so I, I'd like to know what you recommend for the next states for the advanced nuclear uh, fuel, cycle, uh, fuel cycle R&D program. Um, I, I think D DOE, Department of Energy's nuclear energy program, has a lot of the right priorities set in place. So we have an R&D program that's developing advanced fuels for transmutation and, say, and say fast reactors. There's fast reactor R&D going on. Um, there's also work on materials for in reactors and also bench top experiments on electrometallurgical or pyro processing as well as aqueous reprocessing of spent fuels. So there's been tremendous research done. There's being resources provided. That needs to continue. Uh, as I said in my testimony, my plea would be to take that to try to start to develop some down selection 
and actually demonstration of some of these technologies at the pilot scale. Take it out of the lab and start to demonstrate it at the pilot scale. Working with industries, yeah. even by the end of this decade, would be optimal. You know, we really tried to jumpstart with GNAP and, and several programs, and it just it, it just seems to be stalled. And wouldn't it make a difference if we have the uh, the closed uh, nuclear uh, fuel recycle the, the closed reactor uh, to be able to uh, then recycle and recycle and recycle so that we don't have the, the waste that really, yeah. if we were to put uh, the waste into a, some depository like Yucca Mountain, it would fill up with all all the nuclear waste that we have right now. And it seems like before we really, you know, make such a site that really to get the, the advanced fuel cycle uh, recycling going would really be of benefit to how we're going to deal with this waste. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I agree, Mrs. Biggert. Um, I, I, I think closing the fuel cycle will have a, a variety of benefits. It will reduce the volume and the, and the toxicity of the waste. As I said before, there's still a repository required, but you, can, you could design a repository in a much different way if you close the fuel cycle. All that's going there is, is, is fission product waste. And, and you can also optimize the real estate that you take up in a repository, Yucca Mountain or any other repository. Uh, you're also reusing the actinides in the uranium to, to make additional electricity. So it's a more sustainable approach. Uh, the research that we're doing is to try to make it more economic and also reduce the amount of waste that's produced from those processes. But I, but I, I, I firmly believe that if you grow nuclear, closing the fuel cycle is, is the right path. But we've got to, if I may, I, I'd actually like to go back briefly to the question about boreholes because it's a systems question. I would argue it may not make sense to put spent fuel down a borehole, but you may make sense to put process waste down a borehole. So, so you've got to think about this whole thing as a system. Uh, the, the repository has to work with the, whatever fuel cycle you decide to do. And back to your point about the GNAP program, I, I think we, I would like to think we learned from that. And I think we did premature down select in that yeah. case. I think we need to do a much more rigorous job of doing the R&D and having a transparent selection process that would allow us to down select. In, like, a, in a demonstration. Right, into a demonstration. Mm -hmm. I agree. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McLeod, you seem to be. Well, I was just <clears throat> wanted to say that we'd love to see the R and D done at the H Canyon Span River site, which is one of the few facilities that could do that research and development. I might fight for Argon, but we could do it in more than one place. <laughs> Thank you. I yield back. We'd be glad to share. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. <clears throat> Bigert. The uh, chair now recognizes Mr. McNerney for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is an important and serious topic, and, and I'm getting the feeling, or I got the feeling, that the majority party here is using, at least in part, this topic as an opportunity to bash the Obama administration. And so uh, we're going down a political path that we don't need to go down, and I, I'd rather talk about this in terms of uh, issues that are going to help us solve the problem. Um, as a graduate student uh, at the University of New Mexico, I studied uh, and worked on a, on a a fault tree analysis for, uh, for the Waste Isolation Pilot Project. So I have some scientific understanding of the issue. Uh, and my opinion is that uh, uh, deep geologic sequestration is a good approach and it can work. Uh, but I agree wholeheartedly with Dr. Kasperson that public trust uh, and public acceptance is absolutely essential. We're not going to get this solved unless we have the public trust. Uh, lawsuits are going to hold up everything. Uh, and, you know, I do appreciate uh, the comments uh, of Mr. Spencer that, uh, uh, or, or at least the approach that, that we think uh, about using um, a method that will gain public acceptance. Uh, it's just that going to the private sector and letting them take care of it uh, is not going to really engender public acceptance. Uh, and, in fact, uh, it would require an enormous amount of federal oversight, uh, and then there's also profits involved. So I think it would end up costing more and getting less done. So uh, that's why I would, would not favor that particular approach. Um, but uh, I, I do think that you start out, Mr. Spencer, with a very inflammatory language when you said the Obama anti-yucca policy. And again, when you, when you use that language, uh, shutters close and, and people are going to react in a negative way. So uh, my recommendation is to take a less uh, inflammatory approach to this if you want to get your, your uh, idea across. That's just a, 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 a recommendation that I give to you personally. Um, 
Now, I wanted to uh, ask Dr. Swift, I uh, thank you for your testimony, um, and I wanted to ask you personally, do you think that there's other alternatives to the Yucca Mountain that would be technically feasible? Yes, I do. Um, I'll go on. <laughs> one, I mean, one of the things that, sure. that struck me here is I think uh, that nuclear waste has potential value in the future. Uh, and uh, drilling a hole uh, down there five kilometers and just dumping material waste and then closing it up, uh, it's not going to be a repository. It's going to be a dump. Uh, nuclear waste needs to be carefully uh, stored and safely stored and monitored with the idea, in my opinion, that a withdrawal sometime in the future will be necessary. So uh, I can't say that I, uh, I like that approach very well. Uh, that isn't what's being done at the waste isolation pilot uh, plant, is it? The, uh, on, your, on your last point there, the, the waste isolation pilot plant does not have uh, waste that has any particular recycling value to it. Right. Uh, it would it would not be easy to recover waste out of WIP. It would be feasible, and that's actually a regulatory description of, of the situation. Uh, you would mine back through the salt and extract the uh, salt and the waste at the same time at WIP. It's, it, it can be done. Uh, in terms of other viable alternatives, uh, for those that, that are the fully retrievable at all times, actually Yucca Mountain was an excellent, that was one of the, the strongest features of Yucca Mountain. It, because of its location above the water table in dry rock, retrievability is fairly straightforward there. But uh, other disposal options, the, uh, the Swedish granite repository concept, also being employed in, in Finland, being developed there. Uh, the, the French are looking, and the, the Belgians and the Swiss are looking at disposal in clay formations. Uh, the Germans are looking at disposal in salt formations. These are concepts that are uh, potentially viable in this country also as alternatives to Yucca Mountain. Uh, how is the, uh, what's the current plan for, in, for encasing the actual high-level waste? Is it encased in, a, 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 not in barrels, obviously, but in, in glass formations or something before it's it, going to be sent downstairs? It depends on the environment you're, you would want to put it into. Uh, you, you'd want to choose a metal canister uh, that was uh, as corrosion resistant, as long lived as possible in the environment you were putting it in. So, if, for example, in chemically reducing environments such as deep granites or clays, uh, copper is a, a metal of, of choice. It, it's very stable in a reducing environment. In Yucca Mountain, where it's an oxidizing environment, the choice was a, uh, a nickel, uh, nickel molybdenum chrome based alloy called Alloy 22 that was as corrosion resistant in that environment as we could come up with. Well, I guess my final words are that we, we need to have public buy in on this, and, and using inflammatory language isn't going to help that happen. Thank you, Mr. McNarty. The chair now recognizes Mr. Robacher for five minutes. Thank you very much. and. Uh, very happy to hear Mr. McNerney admonish uh, people for uh, using politicizing science and using harsh language. And uh, just when George Bush was in, that never happened. Uh, well, the other side never did that when George Bush was in. Just want to make that clear for the record that that only happens now. Hmm. Uh, let me just uh, note that. Uh, when you find yourself, this is a, a truism that I've learned, when you find yourself in a hole that you don't want to be in, you should quit digging. That's a truism. And in this case, it sounds like to me what we've done is we have a Blue Ribbon Commission who's supposed to come up with uh, alt our alternative or a vision for what we're going to be doing with nuclear waste. And they can't get out of their mind the idea of digging a hole. And um, uh, what I have seen here and what I'm listening to is that it sounds like new technologies are not being addressed. What's being addressed is digging the hole. Can we dig the shafts this deep or whatever, whatever. You know, this uh, talk about old think. Uh, this is the ultimate old thing. And here we were supposed to have a Blue Ribbon Commission that it was going to give us a vision of what was we could do in the future. And it's all been based on only what's been happening in the past. 
Uh, the Blue Ribbon Commission seems, from what I'm understanding, what I can see here, as well as from what I've heard, is that they have been negative or even hostile to looking into new concepts, for example, gas cool reactors, thorium reactors, or fast uh, reacting, uh, fast reactors, and, um, and their interest in small modular reactors seems to stop right at, what say, the water's edge, meaning that they're only interested in looking at water-cooled reactors. Uh, what I don't uh, understand is we have several very prominent scientific and, uh, and uh, very, very uh, responsible uh, uh, companies that are involved with the development of technologies that have told us there are other alternatives than water-cooled reactors, and they have done the science. When one of them is General Atomics, uh, who has a great track record, uh, and we have many people talking about small modular reactors. We have many people talking about uh, these uh, pebble-based uh, reactors, pebble-based for fuel. All of these things offer a tremendous alternative to digging a hole and letting it sit there for thousands of years. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm shocked to hear that we have spent $15 billion on, on digging a hole in Yucca Mountain, but we haven't been able to come up with the money necessary uh, to build the prototype uh, of one of these reactors that would go a long way in reducing uh, the challenge of nuclear waste. Uh, uh, am I wrong that these new reactors uh, do offer a promise in the future of reducing the amount of nuclear waste that we would face, Dr. Peters? Yeah, you're, no, you're, you're not wrong, but I would okay. emphasize the word promising, uh, if, okay. if I may. Uh, a lot of what you're referring to, the fast reactor technology has been demonstrated in the United States and worldwide. So it, it could be, if there was a market for a fast reactor, in, in, in the United States, we could develop that relatively well. Well, a market for market, where's the market for fifteen billion dollars yeah, yeah. to dig a hole but, in the but, desert? But I mean, there's a market for the fact that we'd be creating electricity and there'd be less uh, nuclear waste o uh, left over here, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is uh, what we have here as an example. If you put the people in the in the electronics industry who only could think about building the Craig huge computers of the past, you know, they used to build them as big as this room, and then you got them say, well, can we have, is there any solutions that we might have uh, uh, by building a, a small computer? Well, uh, or maybe there could be a computer the size of your telephone. They wouldn't know what you're talking about. There are some visionaries in this country that can help us solve the problem of nuclear waste. And we aren't even building the prototypes and moving forward in the prototypes to see if they're actually correct. But the people who are advocating this are very high quality scientists and, and, and engineers and, and people in the, in, the, in, uh, in the private sector. I would suggest that this hearing while, and the Blue Ribbon Commission, while they have focused on what, was, what they could have focused on in the 1970s, should be focusing on a vision for the better future based on technologies that can change our reality. And uh, until we do that, uh, I'm, uh, I'm just uh, afraid that we're uh, $15 billion? We're going to waste another $15 billion? Thank you very much, Mr. It, Chairman. Mr. Chairman, may, may I real quick, very quickly? I, I, I guess, quickly. I, I guess I just want to, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't want to disagree, I want to agree with everything that you said, uh, but a lot of the promising ones that you're referring to are on paper at this point, so we got, need to go do the research and the prototyping to Yeah, but they were the put others. on paper by prominent scientists and people who have yeah. built nuclear power plants and people who are, right. we're not saying Dana Rohrbacher put it on paper. No, but we, we just need to go to some really need. prominent people put it on paper. We need to do the investment okay. to How go about, do it. Uh, Albert Einstein put something on paper and he ended up helping us usher us in this, we're into this nuclear world. Thank you, Mr. Robaca. Before we close, I would like to enter in the record by unanimous consent a number of documents previously exchanged with minority without objection, so ordered. This hearing has allowed the subcommittees to hear expert outside opinions about the BRC draft report. For the record and in response to comments by the minority at the outset, the committee was in contact with the BRC prior to the hearing, at which time that they indicated it would be premature to participate. 
as their report is still in draft form and they're continuing to accept public comment. We will certainly continue to work with the BRC as they finalize their report and will likely have an opportunity to hear from the BRC after they finalize their report. I want to thank the witnesses for y'all's valuable testimony and the members for y'all's questions. The members of the subcommittees may have additional questions for y'all um, and we ask for you to s respond uh, to those in writing and please do it quickly. The record will remain open for two weeks for additional comments from members. The witnesses are now excused and the hearing is now adjourned and I thank y'all very much.